radio host, and praise God I didn't go to law school. Um, that'd be the third and final strike. <laughs> and uh, uh, my, my political philosophy, domestically speaking, I want to ensure that we have a limited government perspective to where we can maintain free economy, uh, where people, the upper mobility in this country is provided not by government programs, but by the private sector. Uh, I think we need to uphold the traditional family unit, uh, the Judeo-Christian heritage of the nation that I frankly believe is essential to maintaining a free state. Uh, my, you don't need to answer foreign policy yet, do you? Not yet. Yeah, I, I, I think that the general notion, I, I would say the Constitution ought to be the guide to how we maintain a federalist system. Unfortunately, I think we're moving more towards a nationalist system where the separation of powers does no longer exist between the branches of the federal government and then power sharing between the federal and the state governments does not exist at this point. Uh, I fundamentally believe that the federal government was a construct of the states. The states are not constructs of the federal government. And frankly, that paradigm is being reversed. So my political philosophy would be to move the needle back towards the constitutional foundational view uh, on the economy and on the federalism. Very good. Evan. All right, my name is Evan Mulch. Um, I'm a... Uh, uh, what some people, I call myself a libertarian. I was a, uh, uh, drawn to this political movement uh, during the last presidential election. I read Ron Paul's book, The Redefine. It uh, helped me better understand, you know, the problems in society and how we can uh, um, sort of, you know, take care of some of the problems. Um, what really drew me in uh, was the, the subject of cancer. I mean, to be honest, I, I did a lot of research on the internet. I found out the federal government withholds a lot of the um, things out there that can help people with cancer and uh, I had a dad that struggled and, and passed away with cancer and I understood that there are s natural things out there that the government actually uh, has made federally illegal such as laser oil and one new one that's becoming very popular is cannabis oil and uh, so that drew me into politics but of course by studying the books by Ron Paul and then going into Judge Andrew Napolitano and other folks um, it just uh, helped me understand that there's a big massive problem that we need to solve uh, not, not really just in America, but even just the local level. I mean, the problems exist here locally, so. Well, that's great. So you've got some perspective of uh, where these two gentlemen are coming from. Uh, now what I'd like you to do is, in your own words, describe foreign policy so that, uh, you know, the typical American voter and the non-policy wonk right. might understand what it is you think foreign policy is and why it should matter to them. Anyway, who's going first? You go to start first. Okay. Uh, I think foreign policy ought to shape America's national interests around the world. We're, we're not in a we're, we're not in a bubble, and this is an increasingly globalized economy. I, I'll tell you, by virtue of being a banker, even at a smaller bank in Greenville, uh, we're perpetually engaged in international financial markets. When you have international instability, when you have organizations and, and terrorist groups and activist states that want to disrupt free enterprise and free people, that affects us domestically. So my, my view of foreign policy is we need to have a foreign policy and domestic policy that align to promote American jobs, American innovation, uh, defends this country's sovereignty, and, and at the same time maintains a balance of power around the world that favors a free enterprise system and favors uh, free peoples. And we have, uh, most people do not live in freedom. And we, most of us in this room, I would imagine, were blessed to be born here. And we don't know anything else. But if you study human history and you take a survey of the landscape around the world right now, the freedoms we enjoy as Americans are the exception to the rule of history. They are not the rule of history. And I think our foreign policy ought to maintain that exceptional nature of America and help share that prosperity with the world that desperately needs leadership. Okay. Evan, your definition of foreign policy. Okay, uh, my definition of foreign policy that we should um, be part of is a non-interventionist foreign policy, which many in the mass media continue to call us isolationists, which you are today. So, um, non-interventionist foreign policy uh, allows America to, you know, defend itself here within our borders. Um, if, if there is a war that is just, we are to do it. Uh, every war that we've been in in the past century has been an unjust war. And only World War One and World War Two were, were um, uh, constitutionally declared, you know, correctly. So um, many of the wars we've been in have been due to false flags. Um, each war, Vietnam, World War Two, World War One, and arguably the war in Iraq um, after 2001 could have been, you know, there's still questions about whether or not it was a, due to a false flag. Um, so I think meddling overseas. Um, 
Uh, often there's unintended consequences due to that, and I believe a peaceful, uh, Christ-just, war theory sort of non-interventionist foreign policy is the best way for America to go. And I think it's also best for countries such as Israel and uh, others that are friends of ours if we just leave them alone and let them do what they want. Okay. All right, so we've got some basis there. And, and can I ask, uh, not to, it's not a rebuttal, it's just an addition. I think that what happens oftentimes in the political debate we have is a paradigm that either you're um, more of the Ron Paul, almost, and I never take some exception to this, but you're going to take more of a Ron Paul isolationist attempt or uh, perspective, or your John McCain who wants to set up a base in every country in the world. I'm neither Ron Paul nor John McCain. Just get called an isolationist, and rule number one broken. <laughs> 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 All right, Kevin, uh, discuss who was most informed your thinking about U.S. foreign policy and why. Okay, I think most people know this by now. Ron Paul uh, did the, uh, the best informing about foreign policy. I watched the debates. I watched him say in front of a crowd of South Carolinians that we should uh, do unto others as we would like them to do unto us. And I heard a lot of people boo him, and that kind of struck me as the wrong thing uh, for people to do. And, and uh, the more and more I studied it, I think even when it comes to the, um, uh, there, there was a reporter actually that talked about how Ron Paul's beliefs on, on the non-interventionist foreign policy is actually what, uh, you know, Zionist Jews would actually agree with because it allows them to be independent and have the freedom that they want. And so Ron Paul, you know, wrote, wrote plenty of books. He, he's written plenty of articles. And so for those of us who do study, you know, Ron Paul's beliefs on foreign policy, there's there's a lot for us to go through and to dig into. And, and luckily, I, I believe the truth is on our side. And it's not just Ron Paul that, that, has a, had, that has a right. I think the Mises Institute in Auburn, Alabama is actually a good place to go to get an understanding about, about foreign policy. Josh? You know, I, I think, not, not to just pander to the founding fathers notion, I mean, truly I believe that American engagement in the world needs to be along the lines of how Thomas Jefferson viewed it and how George Washington viewed it. Now, 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 Mark and the audience there may take exception to my view about Thomas Jefferson did view it, but I, I think when you look at what happened with the Tripoli, the incidents in Tripoli, with the Barbary Pirates, which was America's first engagement with radical Islam, uh, Thomas Jefferson didn't go and try and set up a colony. Uh, he wasn't trying to nation state build in the Middle East. He wasn't trying to build a nation state what is now modern day Libya. But he did recognize that a free trade was going to go unfettered through the Mediterranean. You could not have. Uh, radical Islamists attacking American vessels or any vessel for that matter, trying to engage in free trade. So I, I look at the Jefferson approach, look at George Washington as, as general and commander in chief of the Continental Army. They weren't, they did reach out to foreign allies. I mean, if it weren't for France working with the United States, you wouldn't be a country. Uh, that's not to suggest that the American military, that, those, that, that citizen army in the Revolutionary War didn't do the brunt of the work, but it certainly helped to have the French Navy eventually get involved in that French military budget, including uh, Marquis de Lafayette. So I think that uh, the way I would look at it would be the George Washington and Thomas Jefferson approach, and that is strategic engagement for America's national security interests to maintain a stable world for free enterprise and free people. Okay, we're going to revisit that one. Do I get a rebuttal? No, no. I'm joking. We'll go by the rules. We'll go by the rules. If you like to, I'll the rules here. If you want to amend them, I'm all for amendments. Go ahead. All right. Consider, if you will, the following quote from an article entitled Entangling Alliances by David Frumkin from the July 1970 issue of Foreign Affairs published by of all entities, the Council on Foreign Relations. <laughs> it is our true policy to steer clear of permanent alliance with any portion of the foreign world was a uh, quote uh, by George Washington in his farewell address to us. The inaugural pledge of Thomas Jefferson was no less clear. Peace, commerce, and honest friendship with all nations entangling, and I, entangling alliances with none. It became more than policy. It became an expression of a national point of view about ourselves and our place in the world, a view which has contrasted the simple virtues of our republic with the subtle and complex, complex qualities, some would say corruptions, of Europe. 
from 1789 until the Second World War, accepting only our relationship with Panama, the United States refused to enter into treaties of alliance with anyone. In the then 25 years since the end of the war, however, in a dramatic reversal of national policy, we've allied ourselves with half the world. And I'd say since 1970, that's probably higher than half. So, let's go to you for starters, Josh. And I would anticipate we will have rebuttals on this one. From your point of view, why has the United States' national point of view changed so dramatically since World War II? And has the change been positive? Negative. Um, and is the best thing, but I do understand that there could continue to be warfare. But there could be some more peaceful things happening. Who knows? Maybe, maybe it sounds crazy, but maybe more people would get along once we left areas. And I, maybe that's not crazy, though. Maybe, maybe that's what would happen once we, once they knew our CIA agents were actually out of some of these areas. Okay. Are we done with the bottom? We are done with that bottom. We're going to move on to the next question. Uh, a little bit. Uh, lengthy interlude here, but let me get to that. Respond to the statement by former Secretary of State, National Security Advisor, and retired General Colin Powell. There is nothing in American experience, or in American political life, or in our culture that suggests we want to use hard power. But what we have found over the decades is that sometimes you're faced with situations that you can't deal with. We have gone forth from our shores repeatedly over the last hundred years, and we've done this as recently as in the last year in Afghanistan and put wonderful young men and women at risk, many of whom have lost their lives. We have asked nothing, we've asked for nothing except enough ground to bury them in. And otherwise, we have returned home to seek our own, to seek our own lives in peace, and to live in our own lives in peace. But there comes a time when soft power or, or talking with evil will not work, where unfortunately, hard power is the only thing that works. Evan, your thoughts on Colin Powell's comment? I mean, I, I believe in, in hard power when, when there's a just war. I mean, that's that's my belief on when there's hard you know hard power should be used. But to, to use hard power when it's when a war is not just, I think is is immoral, and I think it hurts us as well as the people that we use the hard power against in a significant way. Josh, I think hard power is necessary, and Evan mentioned a moment ago that. We maybe withdrew from the world stage and peace might just flourish. President Obama's tried that for six years, and right now the world's erupting. As we speak, Hamas is attacking Israel. Israel's in, in the Gaza Strip. Uh, you've got China settling its navy in the Mediterranean, trying to participate in, in naval games in the United States. Uh, you've got Vladimir Putin, who thinks he's going to reinvent the Soviet Empire, at least to really be resurgent. Uh, Russia, we have a criminal cartels that are destroying Mexico's economy and destroying uh, lives of millions of Mexican citizens. I think the world's in chaos. I mean, the administration, White House Press Secretary Josh Ernest said this week, we're living in the most tranquil time we've ever known. My God, I hate to see what he thinks is war. Uh, and as to the use of hard power, I, you know, again, with all due respect, and with evidence of it, it needs to be a World War One or World War Two. When there's a mass extermination of an entire race, as with the Nazis in Germany, I don't know what else. I don't. If that's not a just war, I don't know what it is. So I think you have to have hard power to protect the innocent and defend the uh, people who can't defend themselves, particularly our own citizens. My question is, where do we stop? I mean, we know there's more people killed in China, you know, way more people killed in China while, while we were, you know, going in, maybe not while we were in World War II, but right around the same time period. And there's, there's more people killed in other areas uh, than, you know, and, and World War II, you know, it's, it's, it's it's really hard to look at it because you know we, we did come out with German Nazi Germany you know losing the fight and so it's it's good that America you know, actually came out and, and and we were victorious that's a good thing um, but did we need to go into it I don't think so I think I think Germany was going to lose on its own okay. I don't think I was our war getting to in the first place either okay but I think I heard agreement there on the fact that uh, there are times when hard power is necessary. But I think the point of divergence was around determining when it was just. So why don't we take a minute, um, Josh, with you, and then Evan, you, define from your point of view what a just war would be. The most obvious would be an attack on the United States. So we talked about World War II, we got bombed in Pearl Harbor. We didn't ask for that, we didn't start it. Uh, the Japanese surprised, it was a surprise attack against the United States. 
uh, and it was it began a war in the Pacific. And you look at what happened with the Nazi Germany. Here's the Jewish people who were systemically uh, eradicated in an act of genocide by a totalitarian fascist. You look at September the 11th, 2001. We, we were attacked by Al Qaeda, and every one of those uh, folks who in this country is for, I think, immigration more of a domestic issue as foreign policy implications. They were overstayers of visas, and most, I think, all of them were Saudi nationals. So, uh, whenever you're obviously attacked by people wanting to kill you, uh, my philosophy is if you're going to try to kill me and my family, with all due respect, I'm going to shoot back. And I think that's the use of hard power. It's absolutely just. Evan? Well, I, I think, I don't remember all the points from the Crisis War Theory, but if you Google the Crisis War Theory, I think it makes all the points you know, necessary on, on when we should go to war. It was actually a formula that had been used for centuries by Christians before going into war. But I think most importantly is you have to know that you can obtain victory. And uh, you have to know that you're, you know, defending yourself. And if you, if you can see an attack coming, yeah, it's, it's it's okay to launch an attack when you see an attack coming. But um, so you, you've got to be able to defend yourself. But you, you want to be able to see victory too. And um, that's it, it has to be justified in that way. And I think I think Iraq was uh, not a justified war. Afghanistan's not justified. It's, it's turned out to be longer than Vietnam. You know, Vietnam was not justified. And, and keep in mind that false flag events, which are false false flag events, are military. You know, there's there's people that have made it look like we've been attacked by, um, you know, the bad people, and uh, has caused us to go to war. Look what happened to Pearl Harbor. Pearl Harbor wouldn't have happened had there not been oil sanctions on the Japanese, and we provoked it. And uh, even FDR, they had an eight step plan on how to provoke the Japanese into. Uh, Attacking Pearl Harbor, and that's why all the ships are lined up. So it's obvious, you know, that I, I know this is kind of like the Republican Democrat paradigm where I think the globalists want Republicans and Democrats to keep on fighting, and this is what they want us to do on foreign policy too: is let's let's fight amongst ourselves upon when when and where we should be. But just keep in mind that the, there's there's a group of global elites that only central banks, and their game plan is for us to go into these countries that don't have central banks and to wipe out some people so they can install central bank, start a currency. My father helped the CIA start currencies. I know what it's all about. So you devastate an economy, you devastate an area, and you let the rich people in the world set up central banks, and that's how they're going to have this global power, which, which they practically already have. But we have, the, the good news is we have the power to stop it within our communities. We have to take steps locally to make sure that um, they can continue taking steps, but the, the global elites have set up things right here in South Carolina, uh, such as the, the upstate forever idea, I mean, where they're trying to take away property rights from us. So this goes um, directly to home, home and, and these are all things we should focus on, even when, you know, even when we're just discussing foreign policy. We have to understand who these foreigners are that want to take our liberty from us. I, I would love to have a conversation about the difference between Republicans and Democrats on this issue, but uh, that's another topic for another day. I think we've queued up a few. Um, and let me ask you, do you think that the average voter, the average citizen, even understands what you mean by just war, Christian just war theory, or in your case, to grossly summarize, I think, what you said, that you know, we're attacked. Do you think the average citizen actually gets that? One minute. I think people understand the attack. You know, whether people understand the entire, I would say the August, Augustinian notion from St. Augustine of just war theory, um, I don't know if people understand that. I mean, I think you, I think a lot of people college degrees don't even do St. Augustine. Um, but I think people are smart enough, and it's common sense. So I mean, people understand if you're attacked, you respond. And I'm sorry, but I can't accept it. You know, it seems like the, the approach here is that the United States is responsible for every war we've ever been in, that we provoke every attack that's ever come against us. And there are international geopolitics that can be resolved by diplomacy. So let's go back to the Japanese issue for a second. Uh, even if Imperial Japan in the 1930s was unhappy with America's energy policy and international policy, that's why you have diplomats. It doesn't mean you send I Emperor or you send uh, the Admiral to go and attack Pearl Harbor. So I think people understand an attack. I think people understand that uh, these folks in these Islamic terrorist organizations want to kill us, not because we're drilling for oil. I mean, there was no oil drilling when the Barbary pirates attacked merchant trade vessels in 1801. So these are folks that hate us ideologically, they hate us at the core. I'm a firm believer there's evil in the world, and I think that there is a 
a battle, spiritually speaking, to be honest, and we're, a lot of us in true Christians, between good and evil. Mm -hmm. And I don't think God's neutral between them. And the question shouldn't be, is God on America's side, but are we on this side? Uh, try and redirect back to the question. I mean, does the average voter really understand what you talk about, or what you mean when you say just war theory? Yeah. And I think we have to go even back further than that. I mean, let's let's look at how many people actually voted in the last primary election. I mean, the, the average voter is like a small, small percentage of citizens. I mean, we need to look at the average citizens. I think I think the average citizen is um, unaware of what's going on, and they're, they're more than happy to sacrifice, a lot of them are more than happy to sacrifice the lives of the country without even reading a book or reading a magazine on, that, on what actually is happening overseas. And that's why people who do understand the issues need to do their best to protect those who aren't as interested in reading a book or reading reading a bunch of foreign policy about foreign policy uh, because that's that's part of our duty as Christians as as you know people who um, you know are, are for humanity we, we have a job to educate as many people as possible about what is going on and not not do what you know statism wants us to do. I mean, the the, the leaders of, of the United States in the past. I mean, the one way to unite a, a group of people, and, and this hasn't just happened in the United States, but other states, is you 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 find an enemy and then you unite the people to go to war. And uh, what I love when we're on the internet, it's great now because every time there's something happening, everybody's is that a false flag? You know. It, Five years ago, I didn't know what a false flag was. I didn't know that what happened to a false flag. I was all about, you know, World War One, World War Two, Vietnam. You know, um, you know, I thought we were, you know, we should have gone and, and invaded these places, Korea. And you look at the Gulf of Tonkin, who, you know, that was part of the Korean conflict, and it was all, you know, sort of made up by, um, you know, American um, uh, intelligence, and that's, you know, sort of drew us in there. But it's, it's. Um, it's 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 our job as Americans to understand what's going on, to tell the average citizen what what's going on. Because we know Barack Obama, George W. Bush, Bill Clinton, all the way down to ten presidents prior to that, they wouldn't tell you the truth on what's going on, and they're more than happy to draw you in a war to send our young, innocent, you know, young people overseas to fight. I think I heard a third debate topic in there about voter apathy and participation in educating the ignorant on the forums, uh, which I'd be happy to to go down that path on that one. Uh, we're, we're running towards the end. Here's a couple more questions, and I also want to give you guys an opportunity to kind of summarize from your perspective. Uh, Evan, start with you. Is the current situation on the southern border of the United States a domestic or foreign policy issue, and why or why not? Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a mixture of both. I mean, I, I think the one way we solve the problem on the southern, you know, on the border is we in the drug war, that's number one. A lot of the reasoning why they're saying things are so nasty south of the border is because there's a drug war going on. Like I said earlier, you know, cannabis oil is curing cancer, and it's, it's documented on the internet. There's plenty of people coming out and saying this is helping me with Crohn's disease. You know, why are we keeping this plant illegal? Why, why do those of us who are Christians hate this plant? And it's because we've been brainwashed. We have we have a ton of people in prison that shouldn't be in prison. And it's all due to the drug war. It's not all due to the drug war. It's due to the drug war. So I, I look at ending the drug war, and we got to end the welfare state. We have to stop um, having a, a, a welfare state. We because because the they're they're using it against us. I mean, the the the, the legal immigrants are getting better help than those of us who are you know go to our churches for help. It's it's much easier to get help from the government if you're a legal immigrant. And, and that's that's just that gives gives them a huge incentive to come over here. So yeah, we need to guard our border. We don't we don't need to put a fence up. We need to guard it, but we need to take away these incentives for them to come over here. But you know, at the same time, we need to provide work visas for people to come over if they're going to come over and, and not to get them to become an American citizen, but to get them over here and help us make money. Josh, Southern border is that a foreign policy, domestic policy? Why are we one of the first times in the last four rounds? That Definitely not agree. Just look at both. Um, I think it's primarily domestic, but I think there's a foreign policy component. I, I mean, first of all, this is a situation that I frankly believe is a manufactured crisis. Uh, the situation is far worse than it has to be. And, and I want to be clear about something new. It's, it's interesting that every time any Republican talks about securing the border, they're painting as a xenophobe or a racist. Well, what about the fact that the, we now have an administration? is using tens of thousands of Central American children as political pawns and a political debater. 
Uh, not to mention that while you have this false expectation and false hope by illegal use of executive false hope by illegal use of executive orders, the, we have children that are boarding trains and walking through deserts past criminal drug cartels and human traffickers, sex traffickers, and it's child exploitation in the worst form. And our government is aiding and abetting. Uh, so the clearest thing to do in compassionate grounds is to send an unequivocal message to these Central American countries. We're not going to tolerate this. We're, we're not going to allow you. We're not going to reward you for risking the life of your child. Secondly, we need to rightly recognize that a lot of these, while, while a lot of these uh, folks come across the border are in fact children, a lot of them are 18, 19-year-old young men who have been former gang members. MS-13, the gang out of Mexico, is actually recruiting at detention facilities in Texas and Arizona. We are importing a criminal element when we allow 16 to 19 year old uh, former gang members to be treated as if they're eight or nine year old innocent child. We need to differentiate. Uh, I don't think the way to deal with immigration, this illegal immigration problem is to legalize drugs, however. I, I don't think the war on drugs is responsible. I, I think depressed economic conditions in Central America is the problem. If you look at what's happened in Mexico, the United States started engaging in strategic trade partnerships with Mexico. And Mexico finally got serious about cracking down on the cartels. Long ways to go, but the number of illegal crossings by Mexican nationals has fallen by about 40%. The majority of the folks coming across now are Mexican nationals, they're from Central America. So a similar solution would work. Let's help, uh, help the, people, the countries of El Salvador and Guatemala and those to route out these cartels and these human trafficking rings and let's engage in free enterprise with them to develop their economy. But I think I heard agreement there that the uh, southern border is kind of a mix of both foreign and domestic policy. Uh, trying to direct that towards the foreign policy aspect, I think foreign aid is a, an aspect of our foreign policy. Uh, in just kind of one minute, if you could, Evan, do you think that uh, the way the United States delves out foreign aid is contributing at all to the mess on the southern border? Well, like I said earlier, the dollar's going to collapse eventually, and then we're not going to be able to delve out foreign aid. But I think it is immoral to be delivering foreign aid, um, especially when it's it's you force taxes by by the you know by the by a gun from people. I mean, people have no choice but to pay taxes uh, because they're forced at gunpoint by you know the IRS and, and American the American police force. And so it's too bad that they're going to steal money from people and then send it to rich people overseas that do not have the best you know. In, in America, in their heart, and they, they they dish it out to their rich friends in these countries. So I think it's it's immoral for us to even consider stealing from Americans and then sending it to rich, powerful people overseas in order to make us feel you know get get some sort of the upper hand or kind of you know try to get the upper hand in some way with foreign policy. You believe one of our founders had something to say about that, uh, Josh? Foreign aid, the way we're distributing it, is it contributing well, to the mass The way we pass it, first of all, is a problem. It's an omnibus package in one big bill. You vote for all of it or you vote for none of it. I think that's stupid. Uh, giving money to the Muslim Brotherhood to buy F-16 is not a good idea. Um, at the same time, I would seriously like to know what happened to all the uh, food aid we've sent to Honduras and Guatemala and uh, El Salvador. You know, we might start with asking those presidents there, what's your problem? Um, so there's an effective way to distribute aid if we're going to do it. Now, I, don't, I don't think we need to just hand out money everywhere around the world just to do it. But I do think there is a strategic use of some for it. Uh, I would go back to the situation with Israel. Their ability to hold off these attacks is largely due to the Iron Dome Missile Defense Project. The United States is the, the partners of Israel who help finance that project. That is our national security interest because if Israel goes, that is a firewall against crazy, for lack of a better way of putting it. Uh, I look at Israel, I love it. It's a beautiful country, it's a wonderful country, and I love the Jewish people deeply and spend a good bit of time in Israel. But they are like a magnet for crazies that want to go after them, and they hold those people back. And the U.S. foreign aid is strategic in that sense. Uh, first of all, I would say the college won't collapse, but it's not because of foreign aid. Foreign aid is one-tenth of one percent of the federal budget. It's going to collapse because the Federal Reserve is out of control. The national debt's out of control. Most of that's mandatory entitlement spending. Uh, I, I'm fine with abolishing the Federal Reserve, but I don't think foreign aid's going to kill the dollar. The Federal Reserve will kill the dollar. You're getting close to taking out the isolationist moderator the world. Um, <laughs> last question, and then we'll go to some summations. Uh, Josh, we'll start with you. Evan, you can wrap this one up. 
Do you believe there's any correlation between U.S. foreign policy, U.S. macroeconomic policy, and the Federal Reserve? And if so, in what way? You said I go first on this? You go first. Yeah, I think there's a connection. I mean, I, I think there are a multitude of factors that are leading to our current economic malaise, for lack of a better way of putting it. The first thing is that the federal government continually assumes uh, huge sections of the economy, i.e. health care, now banking, we've got a frame, and a whole host of things. So yeah, we got a lot of macroeconomic problems. Does foreign aid, does the foreign policy aspect of it? Sure. I mean, first of all, we continue to send aid, I was thinking about what I would do foreign aid, to Saudi Arabia. This is a country that do OPEC controls oil prices. Those prices are through the roof. If we did opened up the Arctic National Wildlife Refuge and simultaneously approved the Keystone XL pipeline in Alberta, OPEC's out of business, Russia's back behind its borders again. So yes, I think there's a connection. And I do think we uh, any deficit spending is going to drive bad monetary policy. Bad monetary policy is an instrument to cover for bad fiscal policy. But they've got to have a mandatory constitutional amendment, not what it would be mandatory then, a constitutional amendment to balance the budget. I do think the Federal Reserve should be at the very least audited on a quarterly basis, moving towards abolishing it. Mm -hmm. But yeah, foreign policy, macroeconomic policy, and, uh, and fiscal, they all work here, absolutely. Yep. Okay. I, I don't know where to start this point. There, there's no coincidence that the era of unlimited war in America was went, went, started right after the, the central banking system was, was put in place by the Federal Reserve system. And there's no coincidence. These guys, um, they, war is, is the, you know, the, um, you know, the help of the state. Um, I, I, the, there's a number of you know, bad people that have said that, and that's, that's, the, that's the truth about it. So um, in order to um, stop these unlimited wars, we have to have, um, we got to get rid of the monopoly and currency, and we have to be able to allow any business, any person to set up their own currency. And that's already happening through cryptocurrencies. I, I stayed at a friend's house in, in um, Las Vegas this past weekend. He's created the first gold-backed cryptocurrency, and he found all the loopholes in the federal government regulations, and he started it. And it's going to be huge, and I really hope that other people around the world do the same thing as he did. And, and his dad actually fought the um, federal government with this idea that Americans shouldn't be able to trade and hold gold. And it wasn't until 1973 he organized a group and actually flew a a, a, a science that legalized gold over President, I believe, President Nixon's inauguration, and not long after, it was legal again for Americans to have gold. Which, if we have liberty, we, we should have a right to gold and to trade it. And that was just part of the monopoly power of the central banking system. That's what we have to get away with. I, I see there's so much hope in the future for us by by moving away from the central bank system. I see wars going away. I see bringing troops home, and um, I'm very excited about that proposition. I will say, you know, you know. You know Fix our energy policy. You know, look what Tesla's done by taking off the patent and off their um, their amazing you know vehicles. We need to get rid of this patent system we have. It's illegal. We should never allow the federal government to put in place patents to where, and then that slows down innovation. And number two is we got to legal, legalize industrial hemp. Not only marijuana for medicinal purposes, but industrial hemp needs to be legalized too, and that's going to help us a lot with our energy. I don't like this pipeline idea a lot because you know we shake our heads. Yes, this is easy, but we're taking away property rights from people if we're just allowing the federal government to go. Oh, this land is our land, and we're going to put a pipeline through it. This has to be done while you know supporting property rights. That's essential to liberty, as, as I know a lot of people here know. Pursuit of happiness, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Pursuit of happiness was actually property, so life, liberty, and property. So that's that's essential to having a moral uh, community that we have here, and, and um, I'll leave it at that. Well, as you've uh, listened for the last hour, right, I'm sure that you've been able to distill U.S. foreign policy and the attributes and everything is not crystal clear. There's really nothing more <laughs> these two guys can say. But in the interest of allowing them the opportunity to say something else and kind of conclude, make some final remarks, uh, Evan, we'll start with you. Uh, two minutes, kind of a closing statement. Okay, and well, we'll wrap things up. First of all, um, Alexa Newman has done one of the greatest things, I think, for you know, um, you know, a community. She's created something that the government isn't, you know, uh, part of. You know, she's she's uh, created. You know, it's very. It's a pro-life, you know, business. And I think there's so many other things that we can do without the government's help to, um, you know, to be pro-life. Um, one of it, it, one I mentioned a number of times, is let's let's legalize marijuana, let's provide it to these kids with seizures, and so they don't have to go to Colorado to get the medicine. And we we we've seen on TV, CNN has actually showed a lot about this. 
where these, these kids, um, you know, that have constant seizures that are getting helped by the marijuana. Why, why are we not decriminalizing marijuana? And why are we not bringing on these people out of prison that never, you know, there was never a victim, you know? So I, I just, I, I want to encourage people that are here that, and that are watching on TV that it's, it's time that we, you know, I think a non-interventionist foreign policy is a pro-life policy. I think doing no foreign aid is a pro-life policy too because you're not stealing money from people. If you want to provide foreign aid, take it from people voluntarily. Don't force them through a gun at gunpoint to, to, to give them your money and then send it to other people. So um, anyways, uh, we have a lot of money that's going to be going to Alexia for her own nonprofit, and we do thank you very much for being here. Josh, closing remarks. Well, first of all, I wish that there were all crystal clear. I'm going to have to have an aspirin when this is over. Um, <laughs> I, I, I would say pro, being pro-life, if we're going to go in that vein, I, I think defeating terrorists that take innocent life is pro-life. Uh, I think defending uh, countries like Israel, standing with nations like Israel, is a pro-life position. All, all that to say, some of those things that were mentioned there that, with regard to the keys on XL and other things, I absolutely believe in the sanctity of private property. Private companies are going to build it and lease the land, first of all. Uh, there are a whole host of challenges around the world. We make them a lot worse because our government's fairly inept. But the one reason I'm the one reason I'm not all that concerned, maybe I'm just naive, but one of the reasons I'm not that concerned about the United States leading into a world one world government anytime soon is because they can't even run a healthcare website. So running an international <laughs> regime is going to be pretty hard. Um, but maybe that's on purpose. I don't think they're organized enough to do it, to be honest with you. They can't run a health care website. I don't think they can run the world. We're not doing a great job of it. I think we need a foreign policy that uh, has to be rooted in America's national security interests. And this notion we can be just totally isolationist to withdraw from the world is fallacious. It would be great if it were a perfect world, but there's evil in the world. And if you enjoy going on a cruise from time to time to the Mediterranean, or you like to visit uh, Mexico, or you like to go to the Grand Cayman Islands, good luck. Because if we withdraw all of our troops around the world, there's a good chance you're not coming home. So we have to, in an industrialized global economy, be engaged strategically. Not nation building, not occupying, but strate strategically engaged to defend this country uh, and our interests around the world. Thank you all for coming. Thank you, Jim. Thanks, Jim. Appreciate it. Thank you, everyone, for uh, attending and viewing. And uh, Josh, you have a great job. Yeah, I'm just going to say. Yeah, it's just not. doesn't have to see the length of people. It's already killing them. Yeah, so we'll have to. There's something.